Some said I might, but it was by chance. I really found myself in the shango dance. Some said I might, but it was by chance. I really found myself in the shango dance. It were more breathing at the oh, oh, oh. And then the people shouted, oh, sabab, oh, and one of the sang, oh, sign a day, yeah, re, 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 go, go. Oh, sign a day, yeah, re, 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 go, go. I on the ground as if I were dead And then I place a glove, they don't drop me head So I start to dance in salutation To the old moon, give me inspiration Though them say me sin was about such a jazz Sometimes I dance, oh sign and I bat a lot And when I fell the sign, oh sign a day Yeah, re, 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 go, go Oh sign a day Yeah, re, 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 go, go And when I start dancing the ajaja, them say I got to invoke the abadala. So in order to do the invocation, I had to use salt and perspiration to the drum beat. Boop boop be do, ma pai la mi yo, le 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 go, ting bango le an. Oh sign a day, yeah re 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 go go. Oh sign a day, yeah re 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 go go. All about you go and shango before the cock crow and shango. Why ay 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 shango? Oh yo 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 shango. All about you go and shango before the cock crow and shango. All right, brother. Interview with Yar Ramasar, filmmaker and director. Welcome, Yar. Thanks, man. Yeah, just give us a little bit of your background. Well, I was born in Ghana, in West Africa, of Caribbean parentage. My mum is Jamaican. And my father's Trinidadian, sort of Afro-Asiatic roots, you know. So what, what in Trinidad we call a dogla or mi mixed breed. So I grew up um, in Jamaica, Canada, and Trinidad and Tobago, mainly. What was your family doing in Ghana? My father went to Ghana in the 60s to help build um, the nation after a call from Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah, for people to come to Ghana to build the Black Star, you know. So father found himself there teaching and educating, you know, as an internationalist, you know. How did you become interested in film? Well, I used to say in interviews and so on that it started when I was maybe mid-teens or late teens, but a couple of years ago, a girl I went to primary school with, I met her and she said she kept a, a journal in primary school and myself and another student were the only two guys who became what they said they wanted to be. And the other guy was Birdman, he's a pilot, and... Apparently at the age of eight, I said I wanted to make films and be a film director. Okay, so what films have you made? Well, I made mainly short experimental docs and so on. I made 120 films, various genres, you know. I've done a couple of um, stage and musical things like Carnival Messiah, which I shot in the UK, directed in the UK, the filming of it. 
and I Marcus Garvey, which is a musical um, I did in the Caribbean for I Marcus Garvey. Those are about two hours and 45 minutes long. The other stuff varies from 15 minutes to an hour, and these are shorts. A lot of television series, or the television series I created in Trinidad, both were named best series of the year when they came out and so on. And those are series that explored, you know, one is called People and one is called Roots, R O U U T E S, you know, and that just explored the Trinidad's regular folk, you know, find out what they're about. But you find that they are hardly regular. They're old masqueraders making old time masks, or pan men created the steel pan, or, you know, shamans and Amerindians and Hindus, mystics and Orisha and it just goes on and on, you know. I, uh, most of my work's been made in Trinidad. I made nine films in the U.S. before I went to Trinidad, very surrealistic films. But um, on return to Trinidad in 1992, 93, I set about documenting our culture, but taking it from my own stylistic angle, you know. And thank God, you know, the films have been around the world up to about 140 countries now and I've got a lot of awards for them. So something's happening, you know? And I'm just glad to get Caribbean culture and society, civilization out to people through my work, you know, through my medium of film. Okay, so would you say that your filmmaking is closer to like a Hollywood style or an independent style or uh, more like Latin American film values? Um, it's definitely not Hollywood, you know? It's independent in the truest sense of the word. I call my film style or, or, or my aesthetic, I call it carry being, you know, which is a combination of Caribbean and being or becoming. And it's really an evolving civilization. We have a very, very new yet old society. So this sort of hybridization that's taken place in the Caribbean and created all these bastard forms or all these um, syncretisms, that my style reflects that, you know, and I call it carry being. It's very much a Caribbean style, and it's whatever that is, you know. It's very individualistic as well because I have de developed my own aesthetic and style, which is Caribbean, but always reflecting Caribbean supernaturalism and Caribbean being in its essence and, you know, sort of manifesting it through the medium of, of motion pictures, you know. So spirits manifest, you know, and my thing is to have the Caribbean spirit manifesting in all corners of the world, you know, and just being, you know, because we are people about identity. And as I said the other day, you know, you don't want to watch the mirror and see John Wayne or, or Madonna or somebody looking back at you. You want to see you yourself. So trying to come to that point, self-love and a realization of identity and a liberation from a lot of neo-colonial thinking and self-doubt, you know. So these are films of liberation, uh, especially for the Caribbean mind and psyche and soul, you know. Not many feature films get made in the Caribbean, so I mean, how difficult is it to make like the feature films and get them shown in cinema or anything like that? It's a very, very difficult um, proposition, you know, but love is not for the faint at heart, you know, so if you love cinema and you love your self-expression and you, you, you have a mission on behalf of your people, these privations and struggles are just a part for the course, you know, and I will just say to advise anybody who wants to get into cinema first and Caribbean cinema second, you got to be there for the long haul and you got to know the road gets very, very hard to, to walk, you know, and much less run. So you got to have what we call in Trinidad, you see, you know, you got to have a lot of belly to do this, you know, and no plan B, you know, you got to be focused. And you, it will happen, man. And in fact, I predict throughout the, the Caribbean diaspora, which I want to focus on in this regard, there's going to be a revolution in filmmaking. Caribbean cinema is on the threshold of a massive revolution and the players are coming to the party, you know? And what we saw in music, literature in the 50s, maybe post-colonial literature, uh, what we saw in 70s with Bob Marley and, and reggae in Jamaica and so on, in the 21st century, and in the next five, 10 years, max, man, we're gonna see a revolution in Caribbean cinema and cinema expression on that scale. Maybe not as individualized as in a Bob Marley icon, but many key directors are gonna come from the Caribbean. Do the culture or tourism ministries, do they give a lot of support? Um, they have various configurations, you know. They tend to perhaps be balancing bringing in Hollywood or foreign films with reasonable capital to leave in the country. They're sort of balancing that off with supporting local productions that go out of the country. You know, they feed the diaspora intellectually and so on spiritually but then they also you know will 
derive capital for the spaces they come out of in the Caribbean. So they're having a balance going, I guess, between foreign and local interests. What I've always said is charity begins at home, you know, and I'd say on top of that, this isn't charity, this is investment in your human um, capital and so on. So for obvious reasons, I tend to veer towards support the indigenous filmmakers side of things, you know. Sometimes it could be boiling down to um, what I call rent a plantation, which, you know, could happen and caricatures of the Caribbean people in foreign films. And what I call, again, another coinage, that term I created is um, being forced into the black ground, you know, of cinema. And we don't really want that. I mean, the films that come out of the Caribbean are mainly the Jamaican ones, yeah? <laughs> like in the Dancehall Queen, Third World Cop, such and such like that. You very rarely see anything from any other countries. Yeah, well, that's set to change, actually. Sister God, uh, my feature, which I was, um, had its world premiere, it was official selection, etc. at Toronto International Film Festival, has you know, raised the profile of Trinidad and Tobago cinema. It's the first um, a feature from Trinidad and Tobago to gain official selection at one of the four majors. Toronto, of course, being the North American major, and Cannes, Venice, and Berlin being the other three in Europe. So, you know, things are happening, and we kind of jumping up. We reach another plateau, you know? I wouldn't call it a summit because we're always rising, you know? but we've reached another plateau with this film. And I think Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, and so on, if the Anglophone, Caribbean, Guyana, and the, the um, St. Lucia, the Dominica, St. Vincent, call them, you know? And the wider Caribbean, including the Spanish, Dutch, French-speaking islands. We really one nation, you know? So I always celebrate for that. I'm glad Jamaica's coming with it, coming with five features this year. I'm glad that Barbados did seven features this year, and I'm glad that Haiti's doing 10. Okay. There's an explosion, you know? And God bless the Caribbean nation, all parts, wherever the flashpoints happen and so on, doesn't matter to me. It's just all Caribbean, you know, and there's an outpouring now. So what we got to look at is getting it out to the diaspora especially, but beyond, of course, you know. So it's happening.
Your film now, Sister God, yeah? yeah, right. And what's the thinking behind that? Well, very briefly, man, it foretells the coming of a black female messiah in the future, of course. And it's a film that's its first feature in a trilogy because it's going to be three features. And the coming of the black female messiah is going to be told in the course of those three films. And I just want to say that it's not a gimmick for me or political statement alone, you know. It's actually what I believe is going to happen. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. They said all human civilization came out of one African woman, a Bantu woman, nicknamed Eve now. Um, so happens that as mankind falters, a humankind falters, in the midst of all of this destruction will come the force that will recreate the world and that will be a black woman again, as it was in the beginning so shall it be in the end. And ironically or coincidentally, the lead actress in the film who plays God is a Trinidadian woman by the name of Eve. <laughs> and that's absolutely coincidental. Okay. So, I mean, how long did the film take to make? Well, to be honest, man, I first conceived of it about 20 years ago. I had a dream and I was in the States at the time and in the dream a black woman came to me and told me that she was God and that the humankind would disappear and that she would be the sole survivor. And I got up in the middle of the night, so in the early hours of the morning, and I wrote um, continuously for 72 hours um, until I finished the first draft of the script. But it was only in 2005 that I felt this was the time to drop it, you know? And so said, so done. And my intention was, this was my first narrative feature. I've stayed out of features for the longest while, although I'm trained in production of them. But I decided finally to make this feature in Trinidad and Tobago, in the Caribbean. And 2005 was the right time. I, my projection was I wanted to have my, I wanted my first feature, like any filmmaker or director, I wanted my f first feature to go to one of the majors, to premiere one of the majors. So that was my first uh, strategic hope, you know? And thank God, you know, Canada, Toronto is ideal, especially for Caribbean cinema, because we got a Caribbean population in Toronto, very vibrant, and we got a good art community there, and a nice Caribbean media. And it's an English-speaking slash French-speaking space. So all of that is the North American Festival. It's the key to American market, Academy Awards, you know, down the line. So it's an ideal platform. Okay, so how was the film received? Well, the film was sold out very early in the day. And they had an encore screening that was also sold out, you know. So we packed them in. Tickets ran out. And we got a lot of critical acclaim from the showing of the film. And it continues, you know. We got some awards coming up. And we got four awards so far since its release in Toronto last year, late last year. We got four awards so far, Best Director, Best Caribbean Director, Most Popular Feature, and a Caribbean Cinema Award, you know. So I'm very specially pleased about the reception so far. It's been limited in how we've released the film. We haven't put it in full release yet. It's just sort of feeling out right now, you know. It's a rumor or whisper, you know. But I'm so happy with the little times we've shown it in the Caribbean response has been tremendous. And, you know, um, hometown is most important to me, more important than anything else. Okay. Okay. What the, yeah, what the, so in Trinidad, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> Films got sort of limited screenings, just here and there I've shown it. There was a ceremony honoring me by this grassroots, the artist organization in Trinidad called Studio 66 because I've, I was named the first Caribbean laureate in arts and letters um, in October 2006. So that was indeed a brilliant honor, and Studio 66 in Trinidad had a ceremony honoring me with a lot of people in the arts contributing to it, and I was presented with a Caribbean Cinema Award for my contributions to Caribbean cinema over the past two decades, you know. Budget, and well, I know filmmakers always just say duck and dive, hustle, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how'd you go about getting the budget for a feature film? I used high-definition video, and which is, you know, the poor man's um, yeah. doorway to cinema, you know, independent cinema. And um, I use a certain, you know, economy of scale, shall I say politely. So blood, sweat and tears, saving for some years. You know, I put my life savings on the table, roll the dice on them. Okay. And I got some support from the Trinidad and Tobago Film Company, which gave me a small grant 
that was it, mm. you know. So you think like to be able to actually like make a feature, like you had to have that track record already. Like somebody just couldn't come up in Trinidad and Tobago and make a feature. I think it would be really difficult for them. In terms of raising the funds, it might be difficult because you're looking at a track record to know that funds are in the hands of the right director who can execute it successfully. So that's one thing. In terms of struggling with the continuous health that is making a feature on a low budget feature, the constant stress and changes and to be able to, you know, sort of bob and weave and move accordingly, take your punch and roll, move on, you know, to have the will and to, to experience to do that, it's very difficult. So I think if you know starting up, I would recommend, I'm not saying to block anybody into any medium, but I would say go for a short film initially if you're now moving into it. Because, not because it's any different artistically, it's just that the scale of a feature and what it requires, it's very, very tough. So I wouldn't wrap my beak on, um, on a feature, although people are free to do so, it's possible. To, it's not, there's nothing as, as impossibility. But I'm glad I went through all these years and prepared, you know, although my previous work has a life of its own as well. So I'm not negating that, but it's extremely valuable to cope with the changing conditions, you know. Okay, how long was um, shooting and how long did you take to edit? Well, we didn't even shoot in a traditional sense. We, where you collapse everything into 42 days or something like that. Mm -hmm. What we did is we shot probably over a six month period. Same thing with the editing. You know, editing is still ongoing because we have one last final release cut to finish, which will be in the last quarter of this year, 2007. So we'll be releasing it properly. Editing probably took six months to, all told probably about a year of focus work, but not in any kind of day after day, you know? Okay. Yeah, I heard you say something earlier where you were saying that like you were shooting at different times, like um, things like it was a goat. You needed the goat to be there over time. And it's like after a while, like the people who owned the goat, you know? Well, it wasn't a goat, it was an iguana actually. Iguana. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there were a lot of things that changed, you know? I've been known at times to be as an improvisational filmmaker, surrealist, whatever, but it helps to, let's just say, master the medium and be able to improvise to suit, you know? And those creative decisions actually add to this narrative, add to the aesthetic of the film. If you're shooting over six months, I mean, like you don't have a set. It's not like a set that's just there permanently, is it? No, we didn't build any sets. We didn't use any kits. We used natural sunlight and firelight to, uh, to light the film. Everything was built already and available. So in some instances, like the house that we chose as the main house, the guys decided to tell us after we had hired them, you know, rent the location that it was going to be torn down and I kind of kept it open for a while and then finally they had to tear it down. So I just um, incorporated it into this the film, you know, and I think it made a nice little narrative sh um, twist to the film. The house yeah, we, yeah we filmed some of, of it. <laughs> yeah, and, that's the way you have to do it And brought it in, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was just, you know, that's a shift in the narrative. I'm free to, and open to that, you know, I'm that kind of director. I like to... Um, Rather, oh. than, rather than throw a tantrum, all oh, my work's going out the window. <laughs> no, I mean, that does stress you, but then you, it's through that stress you find a creative out, you know, and constantly you're going to find creative solutions to challenges that will constantly come up, inevitably come up in the course of production, especially with a feature in the Caribbean, you know, on a low budget, yeah. So, I mean, what kind of equipment do you use then? Well, strictly I'm um, high definition now. If you want to release specifics, we use the Sony Z1 HDV camera, which had just come out, um, we edit on uh, G5 dual processors with about one terabyte of um, hard memory, you know. So uh, high definition requires a lot of memory. That's about that it, mm. that it. So we're talking in, in terabytes. And that's it. We used, I made, I created the reflectors that we used to reflect the sunlight. Got the raw materials from a carnival supply store, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of improvisation and you know, innovation to some extent, you know. So okay. that's what you use like three cameras, two <clears throat> cameras. Just one man. One <laughs> okay. Just one. So single camera okay. shoot, you know? Which yeah. is traditional film and you know, yeah. no see. Okay. I must say the, the look of the film, we won't get to see it in London here or in a lot of places we won't get to see it in high definition in its original form, you know? Yeah. But it, when we showed it in Toronto it was on a ninety foot screen and high definition, it was extremely sharp. So the research and the calculated risk we took on the medium worked out fine, you know. Okay. You've got to be able to command it. So it was a new technology, but you've got to be able to take it and master it quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah
Karangade, Ogun Karangade, Ogun Karanga Karange, Ye 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 Lomi, Ogun Karangade, Ogun Aribo, Aribo, Zoye, Zoyo, Ogun Aribo, Aribo, Zoye, Zoyo, Ogun Karange. Ogun karanga karange, ye 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 lo mia. Ogun karanga de, ogun karanga de, ogun karanga karange, ye 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 lo mia. Ogun karanga de, ogun aribo paribo zoye zoyo. Ogun aribo paribo zoye. Fida re di re re man, fida re di re re man, fida a di re re man, fida a di re re man, fida a di ja ja man, fida a de to go lo, fida a di re re man, fida a de mo pa eso, fida a de to go man. Let me hold your hand. I understand, and I mean to say, ah, the sakabo, nani kanga re, adi konga re, and I mean to say, ida re, ida re man, ida re papa ogu o, adi jaja man, adi jaja man, ida re, adi kongo lo. A lot of people who like are just saying, okay, we can't do film the old way, right? Because that kind of budget is just out of our league. Yeah. But we want to make films, so the most important thing is that you know we make films rather than you know we run around, run around begging a budget. Yeah, that's right. I think the concern also has been distribution. You know, all dressed up and no place to go, even if you make the film and so on. But the whole distribution. Paradigm is shifting tectonically, you know, and distribution is now as it was in in our music before film. The whole distribution paradigm is shifting, and we have to move to suit. So there are more options open in terms of, especially on online, and keeping controlling more of the profits and self distribution on a reasonable scale, you know. So that's what you're doing there. So you've got your own distribution Ma company. Working on that, we got the Caribbean Inc. Caribbean Incorporated. Okay, so that's what's that like a cooperative or a syndicate of you, yeah. Yeah, well, it's a we have a board of directors and working in different areas, you know. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna bring up an online label as well to cope with the soundtracks first, but also we're gonna expand to having an online Caribbean music label. Okay, okay, okay. So you're gonna do the to totally integrated company kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We got yeah. graphic novels coming out of this film. We have a collector's doll, very refined doll that we made out of um, clay and cloth and so on. Soundtrack, you know, thinking about a video game and a couple of things. So you know, it's really a franchise you're creating, you know. Okay, okay, okay. So without, so it's going to be bits on the mobile phone kind of thing as well. Well, yeah. Well, what we did in July 2006, before we did anything else, we formatted the f entire film for the cell phone, and we, I have the entire film on my cell phone, and we we're going to do some cell casting tests later in the year, and so it'll be available on cell phones and. I can physically beam it to you to a, a Bluetooth or cell phone infrared device, and you can get the whole thing in a limited space. You know. Do you think people are going to really watch a whole film on a little screen like that, or or, or is it just to capture it and then they can transfer it into their onto like a bigger screen? No. Well, what happened is we kind of predicted that the screen on the phone will actually get bigger. And that's why the timing of the release on the cell casting release, so on. Uh, you think it'll go to like what a four-inch screen or something? Well, like no, well, like a flip-up four-inch screen. It could go on that, but we really, really were anticipating the iPhone and phones that use an entire phone as a screen. Yeah. 
Right. So we kind of predicted that we didn't know iPhone would have come with it, but we predicted that the next generation of phones probably kicking in around the time that we'd release it on two cell phones would actually optimize the entire phone as a screen. So it would be just big enough for personal viewing. You link up your earphones like an iPod and you sit down and watch it, you know. We also predicted, which is going to come to pass, that um, last year we also predicted that um, just like you have a flashlight on a cell phone, they will have a little mini projector that you can put up in your room and on some dark space in a, in a pub or wherever you go and sit down and vibe the film. So we're really creating stuff that will fit in into the not too distant future, you know, and doing it at, at in a mo- with a momentum and a focus that it will actually come to pass around the time and rendezvous with the technology as it happens. So, man, you know, people have all these stereotypes about the Caribbean and the laid back scene, and uh, we are laid back too. We lime and have great fun and so on. So, no big scene. We like to party. Maybe it's a bit too much sometimes, <laughs> but uh, work still to get done. <laughs> yeah, but you know, apart from that, we got plenty of um, savvy man. So we tend to be pushing the so-called Western world, pushing them put, um, to do better because they seem to lag behind our expectations mm-hmm. in terms of this film. Technologically, we tend to be six months waiting on something to happen that we predict, you know, technologically. So we're very savvy with that. It's the Anansi principle, you know, the guile that you have to have. So, I mean, do you think that, like, um, like the things that are going on in the Caribbean, is that going to feed into what's happening in America? You know, will that, like, you know, you think that it'll be a reverse thing where America will start taking notice in the same way that Bollywood and Nollywood kind of came up and, like, people started saying, hold on a minute, there's people making films completely their own way. Yeah. You know, and, you know, this is a market. But, of course... Um, of course, but yeah, as you say, we, of course, are giving a lot to our own people in terms of filmmakers creating material content that gives Caribbean people sustenance, you know, psychologically, spiritually, and so on. However, we are actually creating the market as we speak. So I always say, you know, you're going to, we're very creative people, and what we're going to be doing is also being very creative in terms of in the international marketplace. So we're building that bridge as we cross that river, you know, as it, you know, one, one step at a time, no problem. But we, we're creating, we, we break in new ground all the time. We don't, there's no other way, man. You've got to be constantly creating new models and creative infra- infrastructure and so on in a business, in art, in every, any, any kind of way. That's why the guile and the strategic and tactical thinking is crucial. And so you'll see it will unfold. As we do it, we build it. Okay, so Sister God's coming out now. I mean, what, you're going to spend the next six months promoting that? Yeah. Um, last, last quarter, 2007, first quarter, 2008, and that's the end of Sister God Part 1 because we're starting a pre-production at the end of the year and start shooting in 2008 for 2009 release of the sequel. That's what you're working on now? Is that what you're starting to work on now? Yeah. The sequel? Yeah. Okay. So, what else are you working on? Well, I should be directing a feature in Barbados a little later in the year. So that's something. So there's a lot of traveling between the islands. And yeah, man. Yeah. My whole focus is to, especially as, you know, I mean, in addition to being the Caribbean laureate in arts and letters, you know, that opened up another mission okay. or reinforced the mission that I've always been on, which is to consolidate the Caribbean as one people and nation. And this is I'm doing through film. So I'm working on co-productions with other Caribbean islands, yeah. you know, so... So who are some of the filmmakers we should be looking out for coming out of the Caribbean then? Let me just talk for the Anglophone Caribbean because, you know, there's people I know, but in Jamaica you got Storm, Salter, and family. Paul Buckner, who's a producer and based in Jamaica now. Better Must Come, their features coming out, being finished this year, that should be pretty powerful. You got a couple of guys out of Barbados that I know of. I know Mahmoud Patel, he runs the Bridgetown Film Festival and the Film Group, which is a, a seminal force in the development of Barbadian film. A lot of them, man. There are more movements coming out, you know. Mm-hmm. Horace Ove, as you know, Horace is finishing a feature in Trinidad. Okay, so you move with Horace a lot? I'm a good friend, man. Horace is Horace, top of the line, a human being, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, man, we're tight. And... He's just been in command of the British, order of the British Empire or whatever. And I'm big up to him, you know. Now the guy from Belmont in Trinidad, man. So people want to get in touch with you, yeah? Well, I mean, what's the best way for somebody to link you, get more information about your films and generally what's happening in the Caribbean? Well, you can email me at sistergodthemovie at yahoo.com. That's S-I-S-T-A-G-O-D-T-H-E-M-O-V-I-E 
at yahoo.com or you could phone me if you got got the cash you could call me at 001-868-744-4956 I'll try it without the zeros one way to work you know yeah. give me a buzz man because there's a lot of stuff happening I really want to see some co-production activity. I want to be involved collaboratively, especially with people from within the Caribbean and the Caribbean diaspora. And I've been talking with some filmmakers and others in London. And I really look forward for us to work together, you know. We want to make a film in Britain. It costs us, like, British pounds, right? Yeah. But we wanted to come to the Caribbean, right? Yeah. And make our films there, yeah? Yeah. You know, is there ways for that to be facilitated? Yeah, man, you can do it through the Trinidad Tobago Film Company. They look at their incentives program. You can do it privately through alliance with myself or any, anybody who is a filmmaker and has a production unit going. Because, you know, if you want to do high definition features and stuff, you can check me, check a couple of other people. But check the Trinidad and Tobago Film Company. You've come to Britain a few times, so you know, like, a lot of British filmmakers will tell you, oh, what's stopping me is, like, yeah. this is the budget they want to tell me I need for the film, and yeah. I'm not in that ballpark, and I'm stuck here with my script, but I can't move, and... So, you know, that might be, you know, that looks like a way around it, like... Well, yeah, but if you can get British capital or co-capital with Trinidad, for instance, to do some sort of a film that's shot here and there, or even if you can get it shot in Trinidad solely or whatever, um, the pound is very, very strong, you know, against Trinidad dollar, and um, a little will go a long way, you know. My thing about it is I've heard a lot of people with dreams, you know, and I think at this point in time, the conversion of people's dreams per capita has to be better. And it works. Yeah, you know, we've got to see more dreams finish, being, finish product. being converted to reality, you know. Yeah, 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 and because, you know, I, you know, enough of us are sitting down on scripts and stories and songs and everything, right, you know, so yeah, it's got to happen, you know. Yeah, man. You know. Okay, so, I mean, finally, what kind of message would you like to leave with the listeners? Well, I th want to say that the Caribbean nation and people are one. We got to take this broken chain of, you know, and link it up, whether it's through the medium of the computer. But personally, I think we need to do a lot more research, reading about each other in the various islands and in the diaspora, whether it's in Toronto, whether it's in New York, London, you call it, man. Um, anywhere in the Caribbean, Kingston, Port of Spain, Port-au-Prince. Havana, wherever, you know, we got to come together as one people and consolidate as a nation. Um, one love and one people, one aim, and one destiny, one destination. And I don't see a plan B to that either. So we need to go forward and, and build that momentum because we got to consolidate as one. That's it. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks I wish a lot, you, man. I wish you all the best with Sister God. Yeah, my yeah. best, man. Yeah, you take care. <laughs> yeah.
light. Them know they fear them God. The way we pull they light. Them know they fear them shine. Them just a liar. Oh. Kalani, Nigerian director and filmmaker. Welcome, Tunde. Oh, yes, thank you. It's my pleasure. So good to see you in London, yeah, promoting films. Yes, it's a beautiful weather, too. I'm having fun, enjoying myself, meeting so many people. So it's been good for you, yeah? Oh, yes, yes, yes. What was the purpose of your visit to London? Well, um, part of the Nigerian team uh, selected to take part in the workshop um, organized by the Ferguson Center of the Open University in association with the University of Lagos, the Creative Arts Department, to come together in a three-day program to throw light uh, into the Nigerian industry. What did the program consist of? Actually, um, this is like an intellectual uh, bent for our work. This has never happened before because we were just doing our own thing we, of course, realized that there had been interest in the Nigerian industry, but never before, you know, has um, the academic community tried to fit it uh, into their own um, work also. And so this is the first time that the professionals and the academics are meeting and hopefully providing the platform on which the Nigerian industry can further develop. And uh, we have had so many people talk about, for instance, Amaka Igwe and myself have had to talk about our view of the industry from within, from the point of view of practitioners. And Professor Duroni, of course, had presented an overview of the industry and had gone into research, you know, and center questionnaires and so on, at the end of that they have been able to come up with interesting results. So give us a bit of your background, yeah, how you got into film. <laughs> That's uh, very interesting. Uh, when I was very young, uh, in my primary school days, I uh, discovered photography and actually bought my first camera, uh, you know, almost um, maybe about 40 years ago. And since that time, I never let cameras out of my sight. My father had wanted me to be a pharmacist of some sort, but by the time I left secondary school, I knew that I could only have a career that is photography related. You know, so I became an apprentice photographer and later was um, employed as a trainee film cameraman by the former Western Nigerian television. 
and later attended the London Film School, where I was trained in the art and technique of filmmaking, and I have been in the industry all that time, um, in witnessing all the technologies from black and white, then transition to color, from optical sound to magnetic sound, to now lately been an advocate of digital filmmaking, which I believe is the future of African cinema. So what was the first film you directed? I had been in the industry working on other people's projects um, as a director of photography and then have done misery work for the BBC War Service and for almost 20 years I've worked in various capacities and then started to direct just about 10 years or 12 years ago you know and I believe that I have the skill and not only the skill I am familiar with almost all the other complex processes of making film and I'm working and directing projects that I initiate myself because um, the Nigerian industry, it seems to be based around, you know, making films quickly, cheaply, and having like a quick turnaround. Well, well that is the market-driven industry, which is the popular Nollywood. There are other people like myself who are not part of that system, uh, who are, I can consider alternative or independent filmmakers, who perhaps are borrowed from all those other models of the commerce, and with enough uh, craftsmanship, you know, to make our films primarily for the cinema distribution, cinema audience, before exploiting the popular home video circuit. You know, so that type is one of the variety of the Nigerian industry. So is cinema taking off again in Nigeria? Because for a time it was like everybody was just on like home consumption, home viewing. Well, yes, um, for me, growing up, you know, many years ago in Nigeria, before military dictatorship, we had neighborhood cinemas. Around me, I had about six cinemas, and, you know, I had preferences. And we had American films, which made impression on me, and we had Indian films and Chinese films, so it was a question of your preference, you know, until we lost all that cinema infrastructure, and Nigeria as a result of military dictatorship and insecurity, preferred to be entertained in their own homes. And advancement in video consumer electronics gave a boost to the video industry. The film I saw of yours that really kind of made me see that the filmmaking, the quality was getting better was Thunderbolt. Because up till then, right, a lot of the films that I'd seen, it was all shaky sets and the, the boom mic was in the camera shot and everything like that. But Thunderbolt looked like it was properly put together, properly filmed and everything yeah, like that. Yeah, uh, because Thunderbolt is coming from my experience as a filmmaker. Most of the people who practice in Nigeria are amateurs. They are not professionals who have been trained in any way. And you could look at it, you could say, well, that's all right. I mean, if you see the impact you know of the pen everybody in today in this world have access to pen and pencils and word processors but they are not going to be writing professionally you know so you could imagine that in an all comma situation you came across such movies whereas Thunderbolt was not the first movie I was making it was about the fifth one so you probably didn't see all of that all those as well you know so it shows how you could get lost, I mean, mm -hmm. mind filled. So how well did that film do for you? Thunderbolt was seen almost all over the world, and it is on the catalog of California Newsreel in the US for the last five years, and their clientele is towards educational establishment. All the important universities in the US had bought a copy of the Thunderbolt one time or the other, but. Recently, it's been acquired by South Africa's Mnet. Um, the new African Film Library setup has bought Thunderbolt completely now. So it's uh, not Nigeria property anymore. It now belongs to South Africa. Okay, so does that mean it's going to get like cinema distribution? Well, it probably will go 
archival in the first instance, but it's going to be commercial. It probably would appear as DVDs. Okay, you know. that's good. And then um, there was a film showing at the BFI just on Thursday gone. Yeah, tell us about that film. That's The Narrow Path, which is an adaptation of literary material that I was interested in because literature is very important to me. I mean, I read almost everything when I was growing up. And I since have found connection between filmmaking and literature. And occasionally when I come across, just like Thunderbolt is an adaptation from a literary material. So the narrow path follows the same pattern in my project called From Print to Screen. You know, and this way I thought that I would be able to direct attention to literature in another way and hopefully um, get the film to be seen and then perhaps people will look for the novel, you know, in this situation. So that's part of my project to celebrate literature and our writers. So the people in the film, I mean, are they mostly non-professionals or...? It's a good mix of people who are graduating from the university and then people who have traditional theatre background and people in real life, all the villagers and all the songs, all the music are from life. In fact, the chief in the story is the actual chief of that community. Okay. You know, so it's, it's an interesting mix of talents. Is that film out now? Is that an official release now? Not yet. Um, we just finished the film. And uh, as it is now, it's already played in many festivals. Uh, you know, and it's now on road show by the National Geographic Channel in the US. How do you view the way that storylines have developed? I think there was a time when it looked like a lot of the films that were coming out were all just about religion and demon possession. <laughs> no, again, yeah. that's um, the you know, popular mainstream Nollywood in the all commerce mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, Nigeria is not new to filmmaking. I mean, I attended the London Film School in 1976, and there had been other people before that time, you know, so it's not that, again, I think that in the Yoruba tradition, we have had people who are trained as apprentice actors from the traditional traveling theater, who now went into television and now came into making films. Their style and orientation is that of spontaneity, they can walk loosely and rely more on the aura, you know, than formal uh, scripts, mm -hmm. structure, you know. So this element you can see in their work. So it is a acceptable, you know, tradition. Where do you see filmmaking going in the future? Well, I think that um, previously, certainly, Africa suffered a setback, you know, because we didn't have access to the means of production. Certainly the process of using cellular 35 mm as only a filmmaking format was definitely too expensive and excluded developing nations like Nigeria. We just couldn't afford it. But now the new technologies have empowered African filmmakers and further encouraged Africans to tell their story themselves. And this is getting popular as people have found the freedom of expression and can control the means of production, which is available and which is affordable. And since they have stories to tell, they're not wasting time at all. And, and the audience are asking for more. In fact, Nigeria has an important role to play in the development of African cinema. And the future is very promising you know, and looks rosy. So like a film like The Narrow Path, what kind of cameras do you use? Uh, Narrow Path was done over a period of two years, and during which time we had experienced uh, some of the new technologies. It was shot entirely on Canon XL2, and it was shot not on tape, but straight into a computer program and software. So. And by working this way, and that is working in a digital format, it speeded up the process or it removed the drudgery in post-production and was able to have the production period by half 
because the editors, for example, didn't have to capture from tape. I mean, we just gave them file formats in folders, and they just went straight to work. You know, and by the very end of the narrow part, we were actually using mini 35 mm adapter. By now, we had the ability to have selective focus. You know, we were using Nikon steel lenses in front of the video camera, and it was becoming really sophisticated. You know, so narrow part was evolving as the uh, technology. What's the cost of like a film like that? Seeing? Oh, none of that was very expensive to make. I suspect that we spent something like seventy-five thousand okay, dollars to so make the film. That's only like what's that, thirty-five, forty thousand pounds in British oh, money. We would have to, we have yeah. to do a conversion. But, I, I, yeah, yeah that, I mean, in terms of Nigeria, that's oh, expensive. that would be very expensive. So I mean. the average film is what, like fifteen thousand, ten, fifteen. Well, 000? that's again, that's the Nollywood type. We are not yeah. part of that <laughs> movement. You see, okay. so okay. no, I haven't done anything that will cost less than sixty thousand dollars. Okay, you keep saying that. Uh, explain the differences between like. No, the, well, the, I think you that. Um, my industry predates, I mean, Nollywood, obviously, which is just about 12 years old, and where, because of technology, everybody has access to making movies, and some marketers who wanted to sell their VHS or CDs simply gave people money to do that, and so on. So that is different from some of us who are filmmakers, who are storytellers, by the way, and who have experienced film, and, and all the technologies. So For instance, I've come across people who say they've made about 100 movies over a period of five years and so on. And in 12 years, I've managed to make about 10. <laughs> you know, it takes a long time, yeah. you know, before a, a good film can be made. So there's an aesthetic difference, financial oh, difference. Oh, I mean, Is there a the, difference in terms of how you, oh, how you have to distribute For example, I told you, most of, uh, some of the films I made 10 years ago are still in demand. You know, even, I have to keep you know, South Africa away yeah. from acquiring some, some of these films. Mm -hmm. And most of those films that you, you described have a short lifespan, shelf span. They, they disappear in three weeks and they are yeah. never heard of again. Whereas my own work is going to last forever. You know, so it's a different ball game altogether. So it's not the same industry, although it's the same. But um, everybody, you know, is just doing his own thing and you have uh, their own audience. Uh, we never meet. For instance, we don't use the same talents, we don't use the same stars, we don't use the same thing. And so okay. most of the panel of that industry we have never met. You know, so it's uh, different. Your time in London, yeah, uh, like after you've done the talks, did you get any contracts for people to take your film, show your film? People are talking, they are interested, there's no doubt about it. There's been people who are offering to market uh, movies um, online and supply DVDs and so on, you know, so. So for people from London, right, who want to come to Nigeria and make films, because up here, right, a feature film is going to cost us what is going to cost us British pounds, yeah? If we wanted to come to Nigeria and actually make films, is there ways to do that? Well, you have to, you know, obviously you'd have a story to tell and we have an audience and then you can certainly, Nigeria is quite accessible. There are a lot of equipment around, there are skilled people around. There's post-production facilities good there. Now that you're doing it on computer, yeah. Yes, yes, certainly. Yeah. I mean, the post production is longer an issue. You know, almost everybody has a computer and the software running on them, so that's no, not a problem. Okay. But so people do what? Just get in touch with any filmmaker they know or anything like that? Well, it depends on the scale, you know, of your work, and you will need permission from the Nigerian Film Corporation. There are guidelines. Mm -hmm. And it depends on your motivation for wanting to come to Nigeria to make a film in the first place. I mean, it depends on your story, whether the setting is okay for you, and so on. But certainly there's possibilities. Is there a way for doing, like, if somebody actually wanted to come from outside with actual investment, again, would they have to go through Nigerian Film Corporation? Once you have a somebody on the ground as your producer or associate producer, then you can work out the uh, business end, you know, of things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's nothing more than informing the various government agencies, you know. How easy is it to get permission to like shoot in the areas you want to shoot in and everything like that? Location shows? Well, it depends on, suddenly there are prohibitions in some 
some places, you know, but you can get an advance application for permission to film, for instance, at the airport, mm. you know, and then military zones like keep off areas. That's standard, yeah, yeah anywhere. That's standard. Anywhere. <laughs> yeah, you know that anyway. <laughs> the, for some reason, the central bank also, okay. central bank is a no go area. Okay, then what, the, what the main the, the main head of like our Bank of England. Oh, yes, like, yes, yes, yeah, you, yeah. Could, you can't do the it, same anyway. So we do do that. I mean, yeah. other than that, I mean, it's a question of community re relation. There's one more thing I wanted to ask you, which is about um, like regional cooperation. Yeah, that's right. And um, networking right across the region and maybe in different languages as yes, well. Yes, yeah? yes, yes. You want to say anything? No, on that's that? uh, already happening because in Nigeria, look. The closest neighbors to us have uh, been a republic on the southwest of Nigeria. And the colonizers just drew a line and say, you belong to France and you belong to England. So we are already ignoring that barrier. And we are finding that we are the same people. And our progress and development will rest in cooperation and possibly there are even people who politically are thinking of a United States of Africa. Okay. You know, so I think this is the way to go. You look forward to like when films can get distributed right across oh, West right. Africa. So, 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 certainly, because uh, we have um, had one or two local collaborations in Francophone West Africa. And even in my old age, I've started to learn to speak French. Mais maintenant, il faut parler français et anglais. On apprend à parler français. You know, so we, 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 are, we have to work together. Okay, and finally, what are you working on now? I'm working on Pukwa Mwa, which is an experiment because we suddenly think that we have the tools now to make films to feed the idle cinema infrastructure, primarily francophone. And if this experiment is successful, we think that we can revive the cinema-going culture and start another culture together in the whole of Africa by putting into those theaters movies, not programmed by America, not programmed by France, but films made by Africans. What final message would you like to leave the listeners with? Well, uh, all I just can say is uh, a lot of people do criticize the Nigerian industry. People should not forget that it's a very young industry and the uh, rather impatient, you know, with the industry. If you compared us with Hollywood, Hollywood has just celebrated a hundred years. They've not done an anniversary for a hundred years, and we're just 12 years or thereabout, you know. But the interesting part of it is that we do have a very rich cultural uh, heritage. Um, we have lots and lots of literary, vast literary resource. We have people who are talented and very hardworking. We have the technology on our side, and so I think Nigeria is close to a breakthrough, and that within the next few years, you will see another breed of the Nigerian films, you know, so let's wait and see. Okay, Tunde Kalani, thanks a lot, and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.